This is a 1990 Consulier GTP, and it's a mid-engined 80s and 90s supercar, but you've probably never heard of it. That's because it was a failure, although a very interesting and quirky one. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website with cool cars from the modern era. We've had some great sales recently on Cars and Bids, including this 2009 Porsche Cayman S, which sold for $42,500, this gorgeous Hellcat Challenger, and this wonderful lime green, which brought $41,500, and this Chevy Suburban Fire Truck, I love the weird stuff, sold for $9,300, an excellent car for cars and bids. If you're looking to sell your enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, cars and bids is the place to do it. And if you're looking to buy a cool enthusiast car, check out cars and bids with daily auctions and great selection at carsandbids.com. One other quick note, you can follow the owner of this car on Instagram using the link in the description below, and his username is on screen. I'm also filming this here at Moto Tori, which is an automotive storage facility and car concierge here in San Diego. You can also check out Moto Tori by clicking the link in the description below. So let's talk Consulier GTP. This car was conceived and created by Warren Mosler, who's better known in the car world for his later models, specifically the expensive, and track-focused Mosler MT900. But before that, there was this, the Consulier GTP, which came out in the mid-1980s as an American attempt at an exotic sports car. The big difference between this car and pretty much all the other exotic sports cars from this era was mainly weight. The Ferrari Testarossa, the Lamborghini Countach, those were all pretty big cars with big power. This was a lightweight car with less power. In fact, this weighs only around 2,200 pounds, and it uses a 2.2 liter turbocharged four-cylinder with around 200 horsepower that was borrowed from Chrysler. Unfortunately, the Consulier GTP wasn't particularly safe successful. These didn't have the brand name and recognition of Ferrari or Lamborghini, and they also didn't have the power or the presence on the road. There was also the price tag. This cost around $60,000 in the late 1980s, which translates to about $135,000 in today's money. And then there was the styling, which, well, let's just say there were a lot of reasons they didn't even manage to make a hundred of these before production shut down. But today, we're going to take a close look at one of the few of these they did sell. First, I'm going to take you on a thorough tour of the Consulier GTP and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the Consulier GTP with just one of its quirkiest quirks, and that would be the way it looks, which is rather strange. In front, you have these curved front fenders, which are pretty distinctive, and then you have a pretty tall cockpit with a kind of upright windshield leading to this mid-engine design in back. It's all a little odd, and it kind of resembles a race car, which was the point. Warren Mosler, who created this car wanted something you could drive to the racetrack and then race and then drive home. But it wasn't exactly beautiful, certainly not as gorgeous and stunning as the Ferrari Testarossa, the Lamborghini Countach, other mid-engine exotic cars of its time. This one stood out for being a little odd in the styling department. And in fact, there were a few touches on the outside that made it especially odd, like this giant fan that you can see in the back, mounted right in the center, this massive fan that's the radiator fan, because the radiator is actually mounted on the other side of this. It looks like a spoiler, but really it's just the radiator <laughs> sitting there in the back of the car, very strangely placed, and the result is the radiator fan facing out so people behind you
you could see it. You also have a series of vents next to the fan. Those are just radiator vents back here. Very, very strange design and also a very big, wide radiator for cooling. Certainly a strange look in this car. Not as cool as the massive rear wing in the back of the Ferrari F40 that just looked awesome. And by the way, around back, some other things worth mentioning. One, the taillights, which are borrowed from the Chevrolet El Camino. Those are the bumper integrated taillights in the El Camino, and they're in this car too. If you thought you recognized them, well, you did. You also have a center exit exhaust back here, which frankly is kind of cool. You didn't see that on a lot of cars in the 80s, but this one had it. And even though this is a turbo four cylinder, it sounds pretty good. Take a listen to the Consulier GTP. Next, another interesting item on the outside of this car, the body was made of like a carbon and Kevlar mix, depending on which piece you were looking at. It was tremendously lightweight. Now, back then, these materials were very rarely used in car production, so it was advertised as having an aviation-grade monocoque, which I guess was kind of true, but it was incredibly, incredibly light. It was also incredibly stiff, and some materials from back when this car was new actually show Warren Moser, the company's founder, standing on the roof. He was that competent in the stiffness of the body. In fact, the body was so stiff that they didn't have to add extra bumpers. You know all those 80s cars with those ugly accordion bumpers to meet US regulations, those massive things? Well, this car didn't need it because the body itself was stiff enough. So you can see not much bumper area in the front. It's just not on there. And same deal in the back. There's just like this little shell instead of one of those ugly accordion bumpers, which was kind of cool. Next up, another quirk you can see from this angle, this duct mounted on the front fender, this NACA duct that brings air into the car, it's actually there to bring air into the interior because there were regulations about how much air needed to come into the passenger compartment of a car being sold at this time, and so they had to add a duct to get more air into the interior to comply with that regulation. Now, a lot of cars from this era that had a duct like this had two of them. The F40, for instance, has two ducts, but it didn't need them. Only one was functionally necessary to get the air in. The F40 added two because it looked better but this car didn't bother with that, so styling was clearly not a priority. And speaking of styling, another rather questionable design decision is the wheels chrome wheels, and you can see very 80s. These are 15s made by Krager, and they just don't look all that great. Not all that sporty, not all that incredibly cool performancey, and they're fake multi-piece wheels. These are just one-piece wheels, but they have these little rivets going around the side looking like they're three-piece wheels. Well, they're not. <laughs> they're just regular old wheels that really don't do this car any extra favors in the looks department, which probably didn't really help sales either. And since I'm outside, let's talk about the name of this car, which goes down the side in massive print saying Consulier. That was the name of the brand. Consulier was the brand and GTP was the model. This was the Consulier GTP. But as Mosler's name became better known and better associated with the MT900, a lot of people started calling these the Mosler Consulier. So I guess either one would technically be right. Now, as for production numbers, if you read online, you'll find that they made maybe 83 of these. But the owner of this car told me they made 83 chassis, but that didn't necessarily lead to 83 finished cars. In fact, he suspects the real number is more like maybe in the 60s between road cars and race cars. So there are very, very precious few of these running around. Now, this particular car is number 16. As you can see on the VIN, it ends in 16. So this was the 16th built. And amazingly, when the owner went to register this, Consulier pulled up in the California DMV database as a brand and he was able to get it registered with Consulier on his registration receipt. It sounds so ridiculous considering how few of these they made, but it was a car that was federalized and legally on sale, so I guess it makes sense. Now, it's also worth noting around back, we're talking about naming, it also says Consulier in giant letters in back, and on the other side it says GTP LX. LX is because this was the luxury model, the LX version. More on what the LX got you in a second as I climb inside. 
inside. But before we climb inside, I want to talk about the engine, because as quirky and bizarre as this car is, it gets even stranger as you discuss the powertrain. Now, first, getting into the engine area, to get back here, you twist these little fasteners on either side, holding the hood in place, and then you just lift. This carbon Kevlar composite thing made everything incredibly lightweight, and it's very easy to just lift this up, prop it in place, and then you can see the engine. Like I said, this is a turbo four-cylinder from Chrysler. Now, a turbo four-cylinder these days is a pretty common thing, but back then, it was rare to find a small turbocharged engine, and they employed it in this car. They wanted something that was small and lightweight to fit in with kind of the theme of this car. Originally, these were making about 175 horsepower, but later they upgraded to a newer version of the engine with about 190 horsepower. This one, with sort of a freer flowing exhaust, makes around 200 horsepower, which is pretty good in this car that, like I mentioned, weighs around 2,200 pounds. Now, a couple of interesting things in this engine bay. For one, you can see the engine almost looks like it's pointed the wrong way. Chrysler Turbo is facing the car rather than facing out like you'd expect. That's because this engine was designed to be used in front engine, front wheel drive cars. So the engine would be facing that way towards the front. And indeed, this engine was originally used in the Dodge Omni GLH, one of the great hot hatchback models of the 1980s. But when they put this engine in this car in the back, they didn't bother to turn it. They didn't have to. And so it does look like it's facing the wrong way. The other thing that's notable back here, you can see there's a large hole behind the engine. That was for a cargo compartment. These cars had that optional. You could get a cargo compartment installed, but this particular one just doesn't have it in place. However, you can see the space where it would have been to add a little bit more practicality, although your cargo would be sharing the engine bay with the engine. So I imagine things would get pretty warm back here. But speaking of Chrysler and the engine, it's important to point out the engine wasn't the only thing that Consulier borrowed from Chrysler. This door handle on the outside to get in, if you know Chrysler's from this area, you'll know that was used in a lot of different Chrysler products at the time. You open up the door and you can see same deal on the inside. This interior door panel is largely lifted from Chrysler, but especially the interior door latch and this door lock assembly area. This was all on several different Chrysler models from this period. They figured they were borrowing the engine. They might as well borrow some more stuff too. I also like the fact that the driver door panel contains an individual ashtray for the driver of this car. And the passenger door panel contains an ashtray just for the passenger too. I like that they figured there would be so much smoking going on in this car as an exotic sports car in the 80s that one shared ashtray between two people just wouldn't do. <laughs> they needed two individual ashtrays to really get things right. The Consulier company was located in Florida and something like that, well, kind of shows. <laughs> And next we move inside the Consulier GTP and let's talk about the first thing you notice when you open the door and yes, that would be the car phone. This was the LX model, like I said, the luxury version and it included a built-in car phone as you can see here in the center console and you also had this little antenna beside the driver's window looking very 1980s for better cell phone reception. This is a wonderfully cool quirk that you would only see on cars from this era, especially special ones like this. Next up, another luxury feature the LX model had was cruise control. This car, despite being a lightweight sports car, you were supposed to drive to the racetrack and race, it had cruise control. And you can see it's mounted on this stock, which is also very Chrysler, another item borrowed from Chrysler, just because it worked and it made sense, so they used that too. You have another Chrysler part inside this car. Now, another luxury feature for the LX model was air conditioning, which again is a rare feature on a lightweight sports car, but this Consulier GTP has it, although the controls are rather strange. You can see all the climate controlling is done with these three knobs mounted on the control area. Upper one controls airflow, the middle one controls temperature, and the lower one turns on or off the heat. That's it. So you're thinking, well, how do you adjust the airflow, where the air is coming out? And the answer is you do that with individual controls for each air vent. For instance, you want to open or close the vent that blows on passengers sitting in the interior this little switch does that. Just pull it open or closed. If it's open, then air is coming out into the passenger compartment. If it's closed, then air is going elsewhere. You want to turn on the windshield defogger? It's these little switches below the center control stack. One for the right side, the other one for the left side. If you have them open, then air is blowing onto the windshield as the defogger. If you have them closed, 
then it isn't. <laughs> and that's how you control where the air is coming out. A pretty simplistic control for a lightweight sports car. Makes sense. And since I'm dancing around it a little bit, let's talk about this center control stack, which you can see is actually more of a center gauge stack, where you have nine different gauges here in the middle. It's a lot of stuff you would expect. Oil temperature, water temperature, turbo boost, since this was a turbo car. Although there are a couple of notable gauges in here. One is a clock, which is actually labeled as a clock, even though it clearly is a clock. <laughs> But hey, thanks for the label anyway. I guess it's nice to see that. You also have a gauge here measuring hours. This is engine hours, like you would mainly see in airplanes or maybe construction equipment. You do, though, also see hours gauges in race cars. So maybe they thought it made sense to have it here. And so there it is. Not too common in most cars. Now, other interesting interior items. One is the seats. You can see these lovely leather seats. These are Recaro seats. They were fitted from the factory, and they look rather nice and fit with this car's purpose. One interesting thing with the seats, you can see in the headrest this netting here this was your headrest component a lightweight piece you don't have a full headrest it's hollow in the middle with netting to save weight now speaking of weight savings and practicality this car wasn't really all about practicality it was intended to be a focused sports car but it did have some nice cargo storage areas i already showed you the one that was intended to be in the engine bay but there was more in here the glove box unfortunately not really great you have just this little leather pouch where a glove box should be that wasn't great storage. But you did have these little pockets on the side of the interior that are rather large. You have one on the driver's side, you can see it's huge, and there's another one over on the passenger side, a lot bigger than most door pockets in most cars. And if you needed even more storage, you had some behind the driver's seat. You can see this spot back here, pretty good for storage, especially if you have the seat pulled up a little bit so you can put more stuff there. Now, you don't have a similar storage space behind the passenger seat. You can see this area is not hollowed out. That's because that's where the fuel tank is in this car, so there was no putting stuff there. But you did have a few cargo storage places throughout this interior. Now, next up, like I mentioned, this is the LX model, a luxury version. And regardless of which consulier GTP you got, you were spending pretty big money. Like I said, maybe around 140 grand in today's money. So there were some general niceties. For instance, this car has power windows, power mirrors, and power locks. They're kind of strange. The power windows are right here in the middle. They're the only thing in the middle, just sort of set off from everything else, but that's how you adjust them. The power locks are on the door panel using the exact same switch as the window switch and kind of looking like a window switch, but it's not. Those are the lock switch. Of course, neither of these things are labeled. The power mirrors are the strangest one, though. They are in the center control area, also unlabeled next to all the gauges. That is your power mirror switch, and you can move it left to right and adjust the power mirrors. Not really the best placement for this stuff, but at least it had all of it. And by the way, back to the gauges. I want to cover the gauge cluster briefly. Over on the left side, you have the speedometer. You can see it only goes up to 120 miles an hour. Not exactly crazy easy supercar territory. Back at this time, the Ferrari F40 could go 200 miles an hour, and that clearly kind of demonstrated this car's focus as more of a track-friendly exotic sports car rather than one that was intended for all-out speed. Maybe more interesting, though, is the tachometer, which is kind of weird. For one thing, the zero position, the resting position, isn't zero, it's rather four. So the tachometer rests at 400 RPM at all times, not five. <laughs> Not zero, but four. Also strange here, you can see there are two needles in this tachometer. The second one is there to indicate red line. So it shows you where your red line is. You watch your regular tachometer needle climb, and as it approaches the second tachometer needle, that's where you'll want to shift to avoid over-revving the engine. Haven't really seen a lot of tachometers with two needles, but the Consulier GTP has that. And one other wonderful interior quirk in this car is the pedals, which you can see see if you look closely have VW printed on them. This was another part borrowed from another car. Obviously these pedals came from some period Volkswagen model. They must have deemed that those fit and you have VW printed on both the clutch and the brake pedals. They didn't even bother to try to change that. Such was the budgetary situation with Mosler and the Consulier GTP back when this car was being made. And finally our last interesting item worth covering is this compartment in the front of the car. Accessing this compartment not particularly easy. There's no like latch you pull in the driver foot. Well, instead, there are screws keeping it in place. And so to get in here, you have to take a screwdriver, unscrew each of the screws, and then you can pop it open. And once you do, it's pretty easy to open, just like in back, very lightweight and very simple. But when you get in here, you discover there's not really any need to get in here very often. There's no storage in here. As you can see, it's just some mechanical components. You have, for instance, your spare tire in here, your battery is in here, and some other stuff. So that's why they didn't necessarily need 
need to make it easier to open or to access because you're not really going to be accessing it very frequently. And so those are the quirks and features of the Consulier GTP. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Consulier GTP. First thing you notice when you look at this car, I've already discussed styling a little bit, but it just doesn't have the presence of some of these exotic cars. I watched an interview with Warren Mosler where he talked about making this car and he said he went and looked at all the other exotic cars and they were so big and heavy, he wanted to just simplify and he could still beat them in performance. That may have been true, but the problem is that those cars just have so much presence. A V12 like a Countach or a Testarossa and that size and that weight, it may not be great for performance, but that's what the people want. And so when you like simplify and make the car smaller and all that, you are keeping up the performance, but you just don't have the presence. And I think that was one of the issues with this car. But the performance is excellent. Keep your foot in it, it goes. I'm actually surprised at how quick it feels. It reminds me a lot of my old Lotus Elise, uh, which I owned years ago. It's a car that is quick and it feels quick and it's light and it feels like an eager, fun, fast revving little chassis that always kind of wants to do what you want to push it to do. Woohoo! <laughs> I am shocked actually by just how enjoyable this little car is. Very eager to rev as well. You know, this powertrain, like I mentioned, was used in the Omni GLH, very famous car. It wasn't as high performance as, as a true exotic car powertrain, but this car weighed 2,222 pounds. It wasn't much. 2,222 pounds is a really, really low figure compared to even exotics at the time that were three or often 4,000 pounds. This thing was light. And I gotta tell you, sitting in this car, it does have the feel of an exotic sports car. Uh, you hear a lot. It sounds like a much bigger engine than a little 2.2 liter turbocharged four cylinder. It sounds pretty hefty and you're low, you're wide, it feels kind of cool in here. This car is also built relatively well, or at least it feels like it's built relatively well. You know, I drove a Countach, I've driven several Testarossas. They're good cars, but boy, do they feel like crap on the inside. This car also feels relatively crappy on the inside, at least by modern standards, but no worse than any of those. I mean, it feels re relatively well built. It's just using some Chrysler stuff. Now, one cool thing about this interior is there's great interior room. I got a ton of headroom in here. The owner of this car told me that Warren Moser, the founder of the company, he was a tall guy, and so he wanted to be able to fit in the car and presumably fit in the car with a helmet on because these were intended for racing, and that certainly would be possible. The drawback, though, was it harmed the styling. Just like the Panamera, they wanted a uh, tall person to be able to sit in the back seat without any problem. That made the car look awkward. It's the same situation here. One thing I do want to talk about is the brakes. The brakes feel absolutely disastrously terrible at, at a, your first tip in. When you first tap them, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the brakes halfway and not much is happening right now. Uh, but when you slam on the brakes, the owner of this car told me it's the same uh, braking distances as a new M3. So it's pretty good, obviously, but you just gotta kinda work them a little more. That's generally true of 80s cars. Uh, I recently spent some more time in an F40 and it's the same way, and that's now a $2 million car. Well, this thing, I don't know what these cost, maybe 50 grand, it's the same situation with the brakes. Just, just not like modern standards. And handling is pretty good too. The steering is not as incredibly precise as a modern sports car, but there are two great benefits here. One, manual steering, no power steering, obviously a problem at lower speeds, but at higher speeds like this, it corners relatively sharply. The other big benefit of the steering and handling situation, this car is light. The body is light. There's not a lot of weight high up in this car, and so it feels light when you're changing directions. It feels eager to turn and easy to turn, and it's pretty quick to move around. I totally understand the myriad of reasons why people wouldn't have bought this car back in the day. Uh, one, it's ugly. <laughs> There's no question about that. It's also distributed by a company that nobody's ever heard of, Consulier, which is not even a real word. It's a word they made up, and it's both hard to say and kind of stupid sounding. Uh, it's just kind of idiotic generally. And frankly, this car was being built by a company out of like a warehouse in Florida. Like it wasn't a realistic thing ultimately. And I'm sure the dealer network was probably a disaster as well. They only had a few ways to buy it and people would wonder about long-term part supply, that sort of thing. I mean, there's a million reasons why this car didn't succeed, but I gotta tell you, I kind of like it. And frankly, it's a pretty enjoyable car. Uh, of all of the stupid failed exotic cars that I've ever reviewed, I think this is probably the nicest and most fun to, to use. 
Um, the Vector W8 is a cooler car to me. It had more presence, it had a better story, a much cooler look, bigger engine. But if I were to pick one just to drive, I think that this would be the car. And so that's the Consulier GTP. This is a very bizarre car, a lightweight American supercar that's completely forgotten to the world. It's easy to see why this failed, although it's also very interesting and very quirky. And now it's time to give the Consulier GTP a Doug store. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, this one, well, it isn't beautiful or really especially attractive, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration 0 to 60 is in the low 5s, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Handling is surprisingly sharp, unusually so for a car from this era, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Fun Factor is also surprisingly strong. It's peppy and eager and exciting to throw around, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, Cool Factor. This is sort of cool. It surely looks interesting, but nobody really knows what it is, which holds it off from ultimate cool status, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 29 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This one doesn't have much, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Comfort is okay. It's roomier than you might expect, but not exactly a luxury car, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Quality is fine. It's not particularly exceptional or luxurious, but the Chrysler engine is easily fixable with readily available parts, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a two-seater like this, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, value, and these sell for more than you think, likely into the $60,000 to $70,000 range, maybe even more. That's big money for a pretty unknown, odd-looking exotic car with a Chrysler four-cylinder, but this is fun to drive and rare, so it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 17 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is... 46 out of 100, which places it here against relevant cars. It does pretty well, actually, and it should. The Consulier GTP is a lot more exciting than I was expecting. Surprisingly fun to drive, though it's let down by its styling and, frankly, by its sheer obscurity.